Hare Krishna, welcome to the Sunday proper Leela Murtha reading session, discussion. So uh, last class, 
we saw how Prabhupada undertook that arduous journey from India and reached the shores of America. And we saw how Prabhupada composed a very beautiful poem. And we discussed that poem a bit. Uh, so we'll discuss that a little bit more and then we'll proceed. Today we'll also cover the next chapter, Butler, Pennsylvania, the first uh, testing ground. Okay, before we commence, I offer prayers and then we'll continue. Oma Gyan Ati Mirandasya Gyanan Janashalakaya Chakshurun Milikam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurabeni Mata Shri Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swaya Dhrupa Padamahe Padati Swa Padantikam Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakam Ram Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Saad Rajatam Sagana Raghunatha Anvutam Tamsa Jeevam Saad Vaitam Saavadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Nalita Shri Vishaka Anvutam Shri Nama Om Vishnu Padai Krishna Prashtai Bhutare Shri Mate Jaya Pataka Swam and Pinavide Nama Acharya Padai and Itai Kuru Padai Nebora Kata Dhamada and Agra Kramataride Nama Vishnu Padai Krishna Prashtai Bhutare Shri Mate Gopi Parana Vedadasa Ipinavide Nama Vishnu Padai Krishna Prashtai Bhutare Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swam and Pinavide Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prachari Nenu Vishishunivadi Paschatya Deshatari Panchakal Patru Vishya Kapasam Dubi Evicha Patanam Pavani Pio Vaishnavi Pio Gurana Jasri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunityan of the Shri Advaita Radha Rashivasadi Kaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Hukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langai De Girim Yatri Patamaham Bande Shri Gurim Taridam Atri Patamaham Bande Paramananda Madam Shri Chaitanya Vishwam Patanchana Svarte is in the Sharan Sukaram Mavi, Svarte Viritam Sia, Sri Chaitanya, the Mavita. Let me just share uh, screen. Uh, so, in last class, we discussed a little bit about how Prabhupada signs this uh, letter as the most unfortunate, insignificant beggar. And uh, these sentiments that are expressed by uh, the pure devotees, it's not that it is just a drama, just to teach us. They actually feel like this. They actually feel like this. Uh, the more one, one uh, grows in Krishna consciousness, the more insignificant uh, they begin to feel. Uh, like for example, suppose we see a mountain from far, it may appear kind of not very big or perhaps even scalable, but as we get closer and closer and closer, then the mountain looks very imposing. So like that, as we get closer and closer and closer to Krishna, then we realize that Krishna is actually infinite. He's an infinite being. We are infinitesimal beings. Both of, both of us are beings, but Krishna is an infinite being. So we get a sense of that infinity as we get closer and closer to Krishna. Right now, it is, uh, how do we say, the Kupa Manduka Nyaya. Prabhupada used to call it the frog in the well uh, mentality where we are frogs in the well and we have no idea what the Atlantic Ocean looks like. So Prabhupada tells the story of how a frog from the Atlantic Ocean came and uh, was trying to explain to the frog in the well oh, how big the ocean is. And uh, Prabhupada explains that the frog was trying, is it this big, is it this big? And slowly he began to puff. Finally, he exploded. So, because it is well beyond the reach of his imagination, 
the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, even as we sit in our rooms, it may not seem very significant, but if we stand, go in front, stand in front of any ocean, what to speak of, uh, biggest oceans, but a huge body of water, when we stand there, then we understand, oh, how insignificant we are. Uh, it, uh, about a month ago, uh, we went on a trip with to Kanai Natshala. That's a place where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw Krishna for the first time. So we were led by His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Binash Narasimha Maharaj. So uh, on our way back, we came through uh, Sri Chait where Lord Chaitanya met uh, Rupa, Gos Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami, Ramkeli. So to come to Ramkeli, we had to cross the Ganga. And I've never seen the Ganges so big. It, li it was literally like an ocean. You couldn't see the other end. Everywhere you look is water, water, water. You know, and then when you stand in front of that, then you think, oh my God, the Ganges is so huge. So while all the people had said it, there is one boat, I mean, the, each boat can carry 10 full trucks, fully loaded trucks. So imagine how, how vast it must be and how deep it must be. So uh, that's one boat can carry 10, 10 fully loaded trucks. So even though we had heard all these different things, but we could not estimate it until we actually went to the shores of the Ganges there. You know, so like that, uh, the frog in the well could not estimate what the Atlantic Ocean was. Even today, as we sit in our rooms, we cannot estimate what, what uh, the size of an ocean is. Uh, but as we get close to it, then we see, oh my God, this is really huge. So Krishna is like that. As we get closer and closer to Krishna, we realize he is an infinite being. And right now we, have not, we don't have a clear conception of what an infinite being is would be. So when Prabhupada writes these, uh, uh, writes this poem, uh, uh, for example, he writes, Oh Lord, I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So if you brought me here to dance, then make me dance, make me dance. Oh Lord, make me dance as you like. So this is the actual position of uh, the living entities in this material world. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, you find there are three ropes, the more rope of goodness, passion and ignorance, and the um, Mahamaya is making the living entities into uh, a puppet and making the living entity dance according to the likes of Mahamaya. So, uh, Prabhupada said either he can dance as a puppet of Mahamaya or he can dance as a puppet of Krishna under his uh, Yoga Maya. So, only someone who, who is in touch with the reality, who knows the magnitude of reality, understands our insignificant position as puppets. So this is a pure devotee. He is fully Krishna realized. He knows Krishna in truth. Krishna, uh, he knows Krishna in truth, not some theoretically, not some theoretically, like how we, we think of the Atlantic Ocean. We may know it's big, but if you, I mean, Tattvataha means as even if you're able to sit in this room, you're able to understand the full depth of it. You have that experience. That is the pure devotee. Pure devotee is not someone who just has a Bhaktivedanta degree or uh, he studies Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vibha, Bhakti Vedanta. That's it. It is not some information, but it's realized knowledge. It's realized knowledge. So uh, this poem uh, brings out uh, the glory of how a pure devotee actually thinks as an insignificant servitor of the uh, Supreme Lord. He doesn't think of himself as smart. You know, that's one interesting thing about this poem. Prabhupada is not thinking, oh, what are these Americans? Uh, they're all lectures. I know better and I'm more educated. Prabhupada is not thinking in those terms. Rather, he's thinking that these people are so, so strongly entrapped in the modes of passion and ignorance. So strongly. And this is Krishna's Maya. He understands it. This is Krishna's Maya, Mahamaya. Therefore, he prays to Krishna. Only if you so desire you may be able to release them from this uh, Maya. Okay, so let's continue reading. He was now in America. He was, a, he was in a major American city, rich with billions, populated with millions, and determined to stay the way it was. Prabhupada saw Boston from the viewpoint of a pure devotee of Krishna. He saw the hellish city life People dedicated to the illusion of material happiness. All his dedication and training moved him to give these people the transcendental knowledge and saving grace of Krishna consciousness. 
yet he was feeling very weak lowly and unable to help them on his own he was but an insignificant beggar with no money he had barely survived the two heart attacks at sea he spoke a different language he dressed strangely yet he had come to tell people to give up meat eating in illicit sex intoxication and gambling and to teach them to worship lord krishna who to them was a mythical hindu god what would he be able to accomplish helplessly he spoke his heart directly to god i wish that you may deliver them i am seeking your benediction so that i can convince them and for convincing them he would trust in the power of god's holy name and in the shrimad bhagavatam this transcendental sound would clean away desire for material enjoyment from their hearts and awaken loving service to krishna on the streets of boston prabhupada is aware of the power of ignorance and passion that dominated the city but he had faith in the transcendental process he was tiny but god was infinite and god was krishna his dear friend the infinite being also says that he is our dear friend muktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram this is a great feeling that the greatest being in the universe is also considered is also considers us to be his best friend this is what everybody desires in this material world they they all desire to be associated with some very very attractive very powerful people and krishna here the all attractive is saying that you are my dear friend and he is saying this to all of us individually each of us have a special a unique relationship with krishna which no other living entity in krishna's creation has each of us have a special relationship with krishna therefore there is no need of trying to become special and 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 trying to be different or whatever that 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 is dictated to us by our false ego we are already special we are already each of us have a unique relationship with krishna arriving in new york uh so from boston prabhupad went on to uh new york so this is the 38th day on the 19th of september the jaladuta sailed into new york harbor and docked at a at a brooklyn pier at 7 17th street shila prabhupad saw the awesome manhattan skyline the empire state building and like millions of visitors and immigrants in the past the statue of liberty shila prabhupad was dressed appropriately for a resident of vrindavan he wore kanti mala neck beads and a simple cotton dhoti and he carried japa mala chanting beads and an old chadar or shawl his complexion was golden his head shaven shika in the back his forehead decorated with the whitish vaishnava tilak he wore pointed white rubber slippers not uncommon for sadhus in india but who in new york had ever seen or dreamed of anyone appearing like this vaishnava he was possibly the first vaishnava sanyasi to arrive in new york with uncompromised appearance of course new yorkers have an expertise in not giving much attention to any kind of strange new arrival shri prabhupad was on his own he had a sponsor mr agarwal somewhere in pennsylvania surely someone would be here to greet him although he had little idea of what to do as he walked off the ship onto the pier i did not know whether to turn left or right he passed through the dockside formalities and was met by a representative from travelers aid sent by the agarwals in pennsylvania who offered to take him to the sindhya ticket office in manhattan to book his return passage to india at the sindhya office prabhupad spoke with the ticket agent joseph foster who was impressed by this unusual passenger's vaishnava appearance his light luggage and his apparent poverty he regarded prabhupada as a priest 
Most of Cindy's passengers were businessmen or families. So Mr. Forster had never seen a passenger wearing the traditional Vaishnava dress of India. He found Srila Prabhupada to be a pleasant gentleman who spoke of the nice accommodations and treatment he had received aboard the Jaladuta. Prabhupada asked Mr. Forster to hold space for him on a return ship to India. His plans were to leave in about two months and he told Mr. Forster that he would keep in touch. Carrying only 40 rupees cash, which he himself called a few hours spending in New York and an additional $20 he had collected from selling three volumes of the Bhagavatam to Captain, Pan to Captain Pandya, Srila Prabhupada, with umbrella and suitcase in hand and still escorted by the traveler's aid representative, set out for the Port Authority bus terminal to arrange for his trip to Butler. Uh, can you read? Yeah. So we'll, this is the next chapter. Butler, Pennsylvania, the first testing ground. By the grace of Lord Krishna, the echo. The Americans are prosperous in every respect. Sorry, I think there is a disturbance. So I'll continue to read. Butler, Pennsylvania, the first testing ground. By the grace of Lord Krishna, the Americans are prosperous in every respect. They are not poverty stricken like the Indians. The people in general are satisfied so far as their material needs are concerned and they're spiritually inclined. When I was in Butler, Pennsylvania, about 500 miles from New York City, I saw there many churches and they were attending regularly. This shows that they are spiritually inclined. I was also invited by some churches and church governed schools and colleges. And I spoke there and they appreciated it and presented me some token rewards. When I was speaking to the students, they were very eager to hear about the principles of Srimad Bhagavatam. But the clergymen were cautious about allowing students to hear me so patiently. They feared that the students might be converted to Hindu ideas, as is quite natural for any religious sect. But they do not know that devotee service of the Lord Sri Krishna is the common religion for everyone, including the aborigines and cannibals in the jungle. This is from a letter to Sumati Maharaj. Okay. We'll come to this a little later. So Prabhupada had boarded a bus to Butler, Pennsylvania. The bus came swinging out of the terminal into the daylight of midtown Manhattan, riding along in the shadows of skyscrapers through asphalt streets crowded with people, trucks and automobiles, and into the heavy traffic bound toward the Lincoln, toward the Lincoln, Memo, Lincoln Tunnel. The bus entered the tunnel and emerged on the Jersey side of the Hudson River, continuing down the New Jersey turnpike past fields of huge oil tanks and sprawling refineries. The Manhattan skyline was on the left, while three lanes of traffic sped 60 miles an hour in each direction. Nevak Airport came up close by on the right, with jets visible on the ground. Electric power lines spanning aloft between steel towers stretched into the horizon. Srila Prabhupada had never before witnessed anything of such magnitude. He was now seeing for himself that American culture was based on passion for more and more sense gratification, and it was a scene of madness. For what important business were people rushing to and fro at breakneck speed? He could see their goals advertised on the billboards. Now, I remember uh, 
after I finished my, after I came out of college, came out of the university, postgraduate course, then I was, uh, for a while, for about three years, I was teaching students. And uh, we had a, it was on the first floor, and we had a very, uh, like a French window kind of style, but it was very long. It was almost 20 feet wide where we had a classroom. So when I would teach students, I would look out the window, and there you could see all these, it was a highway, and you could see these uh, vehicles passing by at breakneck speed. So I would always remember this, where, uh, what, it, what it would be when, I mean, just I would remember this when Prabhupada reached America, this kind of madness that he saw, uh, that, 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 that uh, the people rushing to and fro at breakneck speed, for what? You know, so I used to also think, what are these people running for? What are these people rushing for? What is the purpose of their life? So uh, because of this, I could relate to what was going on. It's just meaningless pursuit. Of course, he had many times traveled the road from Delhi to Vrindavan, but he did not have many advertisements. A traveler would see mostly the land, roadside streams, temples, homes, farmers in their fields. Most people went on foot or traveled by ox cart or bicycle. And even in Vrindavan, and in Vrindavan, even the ordinary passerby, passersby, greeted each other by calling the names of God, Jai Rade, Hare Krishna. Now there were factories outside Delhi, but nothing like this. The cumulative effect did not pack nearly the materialistic punch of these fields of oil, tanks, mammoth factories and billboards alongside the crowded superhighway, meat-eating, illicit sex, intoxication and gambling. The very sins Srila Prabhupada had come to preach against were proudly, uh, pr proudly glamorized on mile after mile of billboards. Uh, when I said that I used to see this through the classroom that I was teaching, this is in Bangalore. And this is, uh, that was almost about uh, 40 years after Prabhupada, sorry, uh, not 40 years, it is more than 50 years after Prabhupada set foot in uh, America. And these things have come to India also. The signs promoted liquor and cigarettes. Roadside restaurants offered slaughtered cows in the form of sticks and hamburgers. And no matter what the product was usually advertised by a lusty looking woman. But Prabhupada had come to teach the opposite, that happiness is not found in the passion for sense gratification. And that only when one becomes detached from the mode of passion, which leads to sinful acts, one can become eligible for the eternal happiness of Krishna consciousness. Now, this is very interesting that uh, in, in martial arts, there is a technique that... Uh, uh, you use an opponent's strength to throw him down on the ground. So if an opponent is charging at you, those who, knows, those who know martial arts, they know how to use the energy of the opponent to throw them onto the ground. So like that, this is what the pure devotees do. And this is exactly what Prabhupada did. You know, so whatever they were doing in, uh, their, in their passionate ways of life, Prabhupada said, okay, at least give up the sinful activities. And whatever you're doing, just add Krishna. So that is the, when you, when you, when you, uh, when you add Krishna to any activity, it, it is like, uh, Prabhupada gives the example of a venomous snake. If you remove the fangs of a venomous snake and remove the poison, so what can it do? It becomes powerless, although externally it looks the same. That is how it happens with the powerful process of bhakti. So the same activity, when engaged in for the service of Krishna, it loses its material venom. It loses its uh, effect of binding. Rather, it becomes uh, liberating. So Prabhupada said, uh, quite often would say, you Americans, you are, uh, you, are, you are famous for doing so many things. So now do something big for Krishna. Do something big for Krishna. So he used that tendency to do something big for Krishna. So that is the expertise of a pure devotee. 
Prabhupada felt compassion. The compassion of a Krishna conscious saint had been explained in an age long ago by Prahlad Maharaj. I see that there are many saintly persons indeed, but they're interested only in their own deliverance. Not caring for the big cities and towns, they go to the Himalayas or the forest to meditate with vows of silence. They are not interested in delivering others. As for me, however, I do not wish to be liberated alone, leaving aside all these poor fools and rascals. I know that without Krishna consciousness, without taking shelter of your lotus feet, one cannot be happy. Therefore, I wish to bring them back to shelter at your lotus feet. So we had a little bit of discussion in last class about uh, how we should view the world. And uh, this, is how, this, this sheds clear light on it. So we consider ourselves fortunate, but we think, I do not wish to be fortunate alone. Here it's speaking about liberation, which means Krishna consciousness. I do not want to be fortunate alone. Leaving all, leaving aside all these poor fools and rascals. That's what they are. And unless we see them like that, we won't feel like uh, giving them Krishna consciousness and making their life auspicious. Uh, unless we understand there's not a trace of auspiciousness in their life whatsoever. Not a trace. Then we become serious. Oh, these poor fools and rascals. How can I give, be fortunate alone? I need to make them also fortunate. The scenery gradually changed to the Pennsylvania countryside and the, and the bus sped through long tunnels in the mountains. Night came and it was late after 11, after 11 when the bus entered the heavily industrialized Pittsburgh area on the shore of the Allegheny River. Shila Prabhupada couldn't see the steel mills clearly but he could see their lights and their industrial fires and smoking stacks. Millions of lights shone throughout the city's prevailing dinginess. When the bus finally pulled into the terminal, it was past midnight. Gopal Agarwal was waiting with the family Volkswagen bus to drive Prabhupada to Butler about one hour north. He greeted Prabhupada with folded hands and welcomed Swamiji, bowing from the waist several times. This was not any of Gopal's doing. His father, a Mathura businessman with a fondness for sadhus and religious causes, had requested him to host the Swamiji. This wasn't the first time his father had arranged for a sadhu acquaintance to come to America. Several times he had sent sponsorship papers for Gopal to sign and Gopal had obediently done so, but nothing had ever come of them. So when the sponsorship letter for A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami had come, Gopal had promptly signed and returned it, thinking this would be the last they would hear of it. But then just a week ago, a letter had come. Sally Agarwal had opened it and then, in alarm, called to her husband, Honey, sit down. Listen to this. The Swami is coming. Srila Prabhupada had enclosed this picture so that they would not mistake him. The Agarwals had looked curiously, had looked curiously at the photograph. There'll be no mistake there. Gopal had said. So there it is. Uh, Janma Koti Sukriti. Rupa Goswami says uh, that uh, such Sukriti, the association with the pure devotee. Uh, Janma Koti. Janma Koti means in millions of lifetimes. One cannot get such an opportunity to associate with the uh, pure devotee. Janma Koti Sukriti na labde te. Therefore, he says, if one has the opportunity to associate with a pure devotee, one should immediately, without any delay, take it. So here it was. Uh, the Swami is coming. Finally, uh, 
uh, what what how fortunate they have they may they may have been ramapad was the guest in their house the unsuspecting agarwals were simple american people according to sally agarwal who had met her indian husband while is working as an engineer in pennsylvania what would they do with an indian swami in their house prabhupada was a shock for them but there is no question of not accepting him they were bound by the request of gopal's father beautifully gopal had purchased la prabhupada's ticket from new york to pittsburgh and had arranged for the agent from travelers a to meet him and dutifully he had driven tonight to meet him so it was a, with a mixture of embarrassment disbelief and wonder that gopal agarwal helped his guest into the wolf's wagon and drove back home to butler 20th of september butler pennsylvania home of the jeep read a granite clock in the city park butler famous as the town where the us army jeep was invented in 1940 was an industrial city of 20000 settled amid the hills of an area rich in oil coal gas and limestone its industry consisted mainly of factories for plate glass railroad cars refrigerators oil equipment and rubber goods 90% of the local laborers were native americans the nominal religion had always been christian mostly protestant with some catholic and later years a few synagogues had appeared but there was no hindu community at that time gopal agarwal was the first indian to move to butler as the volkswagen bus pulled into town the pre dawn air was warm and humid the morning edition of the butler eagle would soon be going to the newsstands red chinese fire on india prime minister shastri declares chinese communists out to dominate world united nations council demands pakistan and india cease fire in 48 hours shila prabhupad arrived at the agarwal's home sterling apartments at 4 am that's mangalarti time and gopal invited him to sleep on the couch their place a townhouse apartment consisted of a small living room a dining room a kitchenette two upstairs bedrooms and a bath here they lived with their two young children the agarwals had lived in butler for a few years now and felt themselves established in a good social circle since their apartment had so little space they decided that it would be that it would be better if the swami took a room at the ymca ymca is the acronym for young men's christian association and came to visit them during the day of course living space wasn't the real difficulty it was him how would he fit into the bar, into the butler atmosphere he was their guest so they would have to explain him to their friends and neighbors <laughs> kupal agarwal is the first indian then you have a swami with the vaishnava attire and vaishnava appearance in amongst them shila prabhupada is immediately a curiosity for whoever saw him perfection of sight for all the residents of butler just to see prabhupada in anxiety mrs agarwal decided that instead of having people speculate about the strange man in orange robes living at her house it would be better to let them know about him from the newspapers she explained her plan to prabhupada who laughed understanding that he didn't fit in sally hurried off to a pittsburgh newspaper office but the interviewer interviewer wasn't able to comprehend why this person should make an interesting story sally then took him to the local butler eagle 
where his presence was accepted as indeed newsworthy. 22nd of September, two days after he arrived. A feature article appeared in the Butler Eagle. In fluent English, devotee of Hindu cult explains commission to visit the West. A photographer had come to the Agarwal's apartment and had taken a picture of Srila Prabhupada standing in the living room holding an open volume of Srimad Bhagavatam. The caption read, Ambassador of Bhakti Yoga. Beautiful caption. The article began, A slight brown man in faded orange drapes and wearing white bathing shoes stepped out of a compact car yesterday and into the Butler Young Men's Christian Association to attend a meeting. He is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swamiji, a messenger from India to the peoples of the West. The article referred to Srimad Bhagavatam as biblical literature and to Srila Prabhupada as the learned teacher. It continued, My mission is to revive people's God consciousness, says the Swamiji. God is the father of all living beings in thousands of different forms, he explains. Human life is a stage of perfection and evolution. If we miss the message, back we go through the process again, he believes. Bhakti Vedanta lives as a monk and permits no woman to touch his food. <laughs> That's not true. Anyway, on a six-week ocean voyage and at the Agarwal apartment in Butler, he prepares his meals in a brass pan with separate levels for steaming rice, vegetables, and making bread at the same time. He is a strict vegetarian and is permitted to drink only milk, the miracle food for babies and old men, he noted. <laughs> if Americans would give more attention to their spiritual life, they would be much happier, he says. The Agarwals had their own opinion as to why Prabhupada had come to America to finance his books and nothing more. They were sure that he was hoping only to meet someone who could help him with the publication of a Srimad Bhagavatam and that he did not want any followers. At least they hoped he wouldn't do anything to attract attention. And they felt this was his mentality also. He didn't create waves, Sally, Sally Agarwal says. He didn't want any crowd. He didn't want anything. He only wanted to finance his books. Perhaps Prabhupada, seeing their nervousness, agreed to keep a low profile out of consideration for his hosts. Look at the nature of a pure devotee. He's very kind. So he's very grateful for his grateful towards his hosts. So he did not want to create any discomfort for them. This is how a Vaishnava thinks and behaves. He is living as their guest, so he did not want to put them into any kind of inconvenience. At Prabhupada's request, however, Mr. Agarwal held a kind of open house in his apartment every night from 6 to 9. It was quite an intellectual group that we were in, and they were fascinated by him. They hardly knew what to ask him. They didn't know enough. This is just like a dream out of a book. Who would expect to meet a Swami? A living room in Butler, Pennsylvania. It was just really tremendous. In the middle of middle class America, my parents came from quite a distance to see him. We knew a lot of people in Pittsburgh and they came up. A very unusual thing having him here. But the real interest shown in him was only as a curiosity. Typewriter, which is one of his few possessions, and an umbrella. That was one of the things that caused a sensation <laughs> that he always carried an umbrella. And it was a little chilly and he was balding. So he always wore this hat that someone had made for him, like a swimming cap. 
It was a kind of sensation. And he was so brilliant that when he saw someone twice, he knew who they were. He remembered he was a brilliant man. Or if he met them in our apartment and saw them in a car, he would remember their name and he would wave and say their name. He was a brilliant man. All the people liked him. Dheera, dheera, dhana, priyo, priya karo. All the people liked him. They were the both the dheeras and the adheeras. How the six course Swami. So Prabhupada is a very likable person. All the people liked him. They were amazed at how intelligent he was. The thing that got them was the way he remembered their name and his humorous way. He looked so serious all the time, but he was a very humorous person. He was forbidding in his looks, but he was very charming. He was the easiest guest I've had in my life because when I couldn't spend time with him, he chanted and I knew he was perfectly happy. When I couldn't talk to him, he chanted. He was so easy though because I knew he was never bored. I never felt any pressure or tension about having him. He was so easy that when I had to take care of the children, he would just chant. It was so great. When I had to do things, he would just be happy chanting. He was a very good guest. When the people would come, they were always smoking cigarettes. But he would say, pay no attention. Think nothing of it. What he said. Think nothing of it. Because he knew we were different. I didn't smoke in front of him. I knew I wasn't supposed to smoke in front of Gopal's father. So I sort of considered him the same. He didn't make any problems for him. One evening, a guest asked Prabhupada, what do you think of Jesus Christ? And Prabhupada replied, he is the son of God. That he, the guest, was also a son of God. Everyone is interested to hear that the Swami accepted Jesus Christ as the son of God. Gopal, Gopal Agarwal. His intent was not to have you change your way of life. He wasn't telling anybody they should be vegetarian or anything. All he wanted you to do was to her, but be better. He didn't stress that we should give up many things. Shri Prabhupada followed a regulated daily schedule. Every morning he would walk from the YMCA to Sterling Apartments, arriving there about 7. When he had first landed in New York, he had in his luggage a large bundle of dried cereal similar to rolled oats. This supply was enough for several weeks and every morning at breakfast, he would take some with milk. At 7.45, Gopal would leave for work and around 9.30, Prabhupada would start preparing his lunch in the kitchen. He made his chapatis by hand without even a rolling pin. He worked alone for two hours while Mrs. Agarwal did housework and took care of her children. And took care of her children. At 11.30, he took prasadam. Sally. Uh, before I start, okay, I just need some water. Let, just give me a few minutes. I just need to drink some water. Sally, when he cooked, he used only one burner. The bottom level pot created the steam. He had the dal on the bottom and it created the steam to cook many other vegetables. 
So for about a week, he was cooking this great big lunch, which is ready about 11.30. And Gopal always came home for lunch about 12. I used to serve Gopal a sandwich and then he would go back to work. But it didn't take me long to realize that the food the Swami was cooking, we would enjoy too. So he started cooking that noon meal for all of us. Oh, and we enjoyed it so much. Our fun was to show him what we knew of America. And he had never seen such things. It was such fun to take him to the supermarket. He loved opening the package of okra or frozen beans. And he didn't have to clean them and cut them and do all those things. He opened the freezer every day and just chose his items. It was fun to watch him. He sat on the couch while I swept with the vacuum cleaner. And he was so interested in that. And we talked for a long time about that. He was so interested. So every day, he would have this big feast and everything was great fun. We really enjoyed it. I would help him cut the things. He would spice it and we would laugh. He was the most enjoyable man. Most enjoyable man. I really felt like a sort of daughter to him, even in such a short time. Like he was my father-in-law. He was a friend of my father-in-law, but I really felt very close to him. He enjoyed everything. I liked him. I thought he was tremendous. So, uh, notice how Prabhupada is, uh, uh, he doesn't intrude into anyone's life. He goes, this is a pure devotee. He, he goes on with his life. He's a guest in someone's house. He doesn't interrupt their life in any manner. In fact, he, he makes their life even better. Like she, she could get the noon meal for all of them. And uh, the, 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 way, the ways of the working of the Lord are very inconceivable. The same Prabhupada, whom some years later, disciples were trying to get even a few moments of association with him. Look at him. Look at the fortune of this good lady, Sally Agarwal. She spent so much time with Shila Prabhupada. I mean, such valuable time with Shila Prabhupada. I mean, so she, she must be really fortunate to be blessed with Prabhupada's association like this. After lunch, Prabhupada would leave about 1 p.m. and walk to the Young Men's Christian Association where the Agarwals figured he must have worked at his writing until 5. He would come back to their, apart, apart, he would come back to their apartment about 6 in the evening after they had taken their meal. They, eat, they ate meat so Mrs. Agarwal was careful to have it cleared away before he came. When one night he came early, she said, Oh Swamiji, we have just cooked meat and the smell will be very disagreeable to you. Disagreeable to you. But he said, Oh, think nothing of it. Think nothing of it. This is classic Prabhupada. I mean, in fact, he speaks about how uh, sometimes when you would keep his food in the, re in the refrigerator, there would also be meat left by Sally, Sally Agarwal in the fridge. But Prabhupada did not say anything because it was their fridge and Prabhupada respected the fact that he was a host. He didn't try to chastise them. He did nothing. He just said that is their business. He just allowed them to lead their life while drawing them also to Krishna consciousness. In the evening, he would speak with guests. The guests would usually take coffee and other refreshments, but he would request a glass of warm milk at 9 o'clock. He would stay speaking until 9.30 or 10, and then Mr. Agarwal would drive him back to the YMCA. Prabhupada would also do his own laundry every day. He washed his clothes in the Agarwal's bathroom and hung them to dry outside. He sometimes accompanied the Agarwals to the laundromat and was interested to see how Americans washed and dried their clothes. To Sally, he seemed very interested in the American ways of people. Sally, our boy Bridge was six or 
seven months old when the Swami came and the Indians love boys. The Swami liked bridge. He was there when bridge first stood. The first time bridge made the attempt and actually succeeded, the Swami stood up and clapped. It was a celebration. Another time, our baby teeped on the Swami's shoes. I thought, oh, those shoes. They've been all over India and my kid is chewing on them. You know how a mother would feel. But look at that baby. Look at that baby. How fortunate that baby was to chew on Prabhupada's shoes. Almost every night, he used to sit in the next door neighbor's backyard. We sat out there sometimes with him. Or we stayed in the living room. One time, something happened with our little girl, Pamela, who was only three years old. I used to take her to Sunday school and she learned about Jesus in Sunday school. Then when, he, when, then when she would see Swamiji with his robes on and everything, she called him Swami Jesus. And this one time when it dawned on us what she was saying, she called him Swami Jesus and Swami smiled and said, and a little child shall lead them. It was so funny. Sally Agarwal, if you know, if you if you have seen that video, you are a well wisher. There is actually a clip of Sally Agarwal speaking, and uh, there she mentions uh, that when Prabhupada smiled, Prabhupada laughed. He said she she her eyes widened and she says it was oceanic. Prabhupada's smile and his laughter was like, was oceanic, she says. Prabhupada spoke to various groups in the community. He spoke at the Lions Club in early October and received a formal document. Be it known that A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami was a guest at the Lions Club of Butler, Pennsylvania. And as an expression of appreciation for services rendered, the club tenders this acknowledgement. He also gave a talk at the Y and at the Y, but I think it's YMCA. Oh, I don't know. And at St. Fidelis Seminary College in Herman, Pennsylvania. And he spoke regularly to guests at the Agarwal home. One minute. Let me just check. What is that Y? It's YMCA. No, it is why you. I don't know what it is. <laughs> he also gave a talk at the Y and at St. Fidelis Seminary College in Herman, Pennsylvania. And he spoke regularly to guests at the Agarwal home. When Professor Larson, the chairman of the philosophy department at Slippery Rock State College, read in the Butler Eagle of a visiting Indian Swami and Vedic scholar, he phoned the Agarwal's home to invite Prabhupada to lecture on campus. Alan Larson, I called the number given in the newspaper article, but it turned out that the Swamiji was actually staying in a room at the YMCA. When I arrived, he was waiting on the street corner and I picked him up. He seemed very much alone. When we were driving to Slippery Rock, I asked him to pronounce his name for me so I would have to so I would have it right when I introduced him to my class. He said, Swamiji Bhaktivedanta. And then he proceeded to tell, tell me what that meant. Screen sharing is paused. Sorry, I think by mistake, I hit some wrong button. Screen sharing paused. And then he proceeded to tell me what that meant. Since I was not used to Indian names, he had to repeat it several times before I got it right. He showed no impatience with my slowness. 
even at this early junction of our association i was convinced that this man had an inner stability and strength that would be very difficult to shake and this in initial impression was further reinforced throughout the rather busy day because professor lasson was receptive he could see this thing that probably there is a certain inner stability and strength that would be very difficult to shake this is the conviction of a pure devotee the conviction in the mission of a spiritual master the conviction in the mission of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu a hundred students from several classes had gathered to hear the lecture as prabhupad in his natural unrehearsed manner walked down the aisle up the three wooden steps and on to the plain wooden stage he sat down erect and cross cross legged and began softly singing hare krishna his eyes closed then he stood and spoke without a lectern or microphone and answered questions from the audience the program lasted only 50 minutes and ended abruptly with a bell with a bell signaling the next class first kirtan then a talk this proper style standard style quite often at the end of the class also they would be kirtan anand nas after the first class i had a short conversation with the swami g while sitting outside on a bench on the campus lawn most of the time when he was not directly engaged in conversation he would repeat a short prayer while moving prayer beads through his fingers he was sitting up cross legged and we were speaking back and forth he said that the trees around us were beautiful and he asked what kind of trees are these i replied they are shade trees then he said that it was then he said that it was too bad they weren't fruit or nut trees to provide food and benefit people this is the vedic standard they say a tree is known by its fruits a fruit tree is considered superior to a shade tree in vedic tradition at 1 o'clock prabhupad lectured again afterward he accompanied dr mohan sharma a member of the faculty who had attended the lecture and a 16 year old and a 16 year old daughter mini dr sharma's campus residence prabhupad accepted warm milk and dried fruit and at dr sharma's request blessed his home and touched the forehead of his daughter in a gesture of benediction around 3 o'clock professor lasson drove back to butler alan lasson the swami he seemed to present himself as an indian scholar who had come for a short time to do translation work i never thought of him as a missionary but during the course of the day there grew in me a warm affection for this man because he was unmistakably a good man but found his way to a stability and peace that is very rare the lectures in pennsylvania gave prabhupa his first readings of how his message would be received in america at commonwealth pyre in boston he had stated in his poem i am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts they will certainly feel gladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life now this principle was actually being tested in the field would they be able to understand were they interested would they surrender october 15th shri prabhupad received a letter from sumati morarji in bombay pujya swami i am in due receipt of your letter dated the 24th ultimo and glad to know that you have reached, safely reached the usa after suffering from sea sickness I thank you for your greetings and blessings. I know by now you must have recovered fully from the sickness and must be keeping good health. I was delighted to read that you have started your activities in the states. 
and have already delivered some lectures. I pray to Lord Balakrishna. She belonged to the Vallabhacharya Sampradaya where they worship Lord Balakrishna. That's why she writes like this. I pray to Lord Balakrishna, Pushtimar. I pray to Lord Balakrishna to give you enough strength to enable you to carry the message of Sri ba of Sri Bhagavatam. I feel that you should stay there until you fully recover from your illness and return only after you have completed your mission. Hope everything is normal with respects. Your sincerely, Sumati Murarji. So she is encouraging Prabhupada to complete his mission. Prabhupada regarded the last line of this letter as especially significant. His well-wisher was urging him to stay in America until he had completed his mission. He had told the immigration officials in New York that he would be staying in America for two months. I have one month sponsorship in Butler Rita and then I have no support. So perhaps I can stay another month. So he had said two months. Sumati Maharaji, however, was urging him to stay on. He saw that the prospects for preaching to the Americans were good, but he felt he would need support from India. At any, ra at any rate, he had spent long enough in Butler and he now had one month left in America. So he decided to go to New York City and try to preach there before his time was up. But first he wanted to visit Philadelphia where he had arranged a meeting with the Sanskrit professor Dr. Norman Brown at the University of Pennsylvania. Mrs. Agarwal was sorry to see him go. So Prabhupada was, had a sponsorship of one month. So he for one month he stayed uh, with, you could say, with Sally Agarwal and Gopal Agarwal and the YMCA. So after one month, Prabhupada was leaving to New York. Mrs. Agarwal was sorry to see him go. Sally, after a month, I really loved this song. I felt protective in a way and he wanted to go to Philadelphia. But I couldn't imagine, I told him, I could not imagine him going to Philadelphia for two days. He was going to speak there and then to New York. But he knew no one in New York. If the thing didn't pan out in Philadelphia, he was just going to New York and then there was no one. I just couldn't imagine. It made me sick. I remember the night he was leaving, about two in the morning. I remember sitting there as long as he could wait before Gopal took him to Pittsburgh to get on that bus. Gopal got a handful of change and I remember telling him how to put the money in the slot so that he could take a bath at the bus station because he was supposed to take a bath a few times a day. <laughs> and Gopal told him how to do that and told him about the automats in New York. He told him what he could eat and what he couldn't eat. And he, gave, and he gave him these coins in a sock. And that's all he left us with. As a sannyasi, Srila Prabhupada is used to picking up and leaving one place for another. As a mendicant preacher, he had no remorse about leaving behind the quiet life of the butler YMCA and he had no attachment for the domestic habitat where he would cook and talk with Sally Agarwal about vacuum cleaners, frozen foods and American ways. Notice this, that he had everything relatively nice, but Prabhupada is very focused on the mission of his spiritual master. So he had no attachment for the domestic habitat where he would cook and talk Robert doesn't settle into material comfort. He just doesn't settle into material comfort. He remains steady, focused. But why had he gone to Butler? And why was he going to New York? He saw it as Krishna's grace. As a pure devotee of Krishna, he wanted to be an instrument for distributing Krishna consciousness. His stay in Butler had been helpful. He had gotten first-hand experience of American life and he gained confidence that his health was strong and his message communicable. He was glad to see 
that America had the necessary ingredients for his Indian vegetarian diet and that the people could understand his English. He had learned that casual one-time lectures here and there were of limited value and that although there would be opposition from the established religions, people individually were very much interested in what he had to say. On October 18th, he left Butler via Philadelphia for New York City. Okay, so that brings us to the end of uh, chapter two. Okay, so we'll stop with that for today. So just give me a second, I just need to drink some more water. Yeah. So, any uh, comments or questions? Now we'll start moving a little bit more faster because these, uh, I mean, a little bit, I mean, we'll go at this pace for a little bit more time because these are the initial days of America. So, we really need to see all the intricate details of how things happened when Trump has reached America. Vishnu Prabhuji, Nanak Nam Prabhuji. Um, uh, Prabhuji, I think uh, maybe I would have missed uh, a couple of uh, minutes of the today's uh, uh, class, but I just wanted to know like, uh, what's the connection uh, the Prabhupada got with the Gopal Agarwal's family? And how did he got that sponsorship that he can stay at Gopal Agarwal's family, Prabhuji? You know, when, uh, if, if, you, if you remember, when we did the first volume of the Lila Murda, mm -hmm. to get a visa, you need a sponsor. So, uh, uh, Mr. Gopal's, Gopal Agarwal's father was a businessman in Mathura. And he would, uh, he would arrange the sponsorship letter through his son, Gopal Agarwal, who was in Pennsylvania. He had arranged for different sadhus, but nobody had actually gone to America. Prabhupada is the first person who took uh, mm -hmm. put that sponsorship letter to full use and actually went there. That's why they're also surprised that when he actually reached uh, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. He's a businessman in the Matra. Yeah, Gopal Agarwal's father is a businessman in Matra. Yes. Okay, not, not very way connected to the Gaudiya Vaishnavism or something. No, no, not at all. No. He's just a businessman. Yeah. Who had, a, who used to like, I mean, who liked the cause of Sanatan Dharma and you did try to help sadhus to go abroad and preach the message. Okay, Prabhuji. Got it. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Anuradha Mataji. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Dhanavat Pranam. Dhanavat. Uh, Prabhu, in the beginning of the class, you were just saying how each of us is unique. And we don't have to change because we have a certain relationship with Krishna. And we can see that in Srila Prabhupada's dealings with all his disciples. He accepted them no matter what. Yes. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you know, when, when, we, uh, when we are either new to a congregation or, you know, even if we are trying to be part of the congregation, we see that within the congregation also, you know, there are... Uh, there are groups and it's sometimes very difficult to be accepted by them. And then you try to mold yourself in a certain way to be accepted. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, there, are, uh, there are two kinds of uniqueness. One is the constitutional uniqueness of the soul. You know? So each, each soul has got a different personality. You know? And that is an eternal nature of the soul. Every soul is unique and special. 
However, in the material world, our personality is determined by the specific combination of modes that we are in. So, uh, what we have to do in such a circumstances that as much as possible, we can try to engage our conditioning in the service of the Lord, but we should also be able to stretch beyond our comfort zones. Like if everyone were to do whatever they wanted, then uh, together to push the movement is not easy. Therefore, Prabhupada said that your love for me will be shown by how much you cooperate together to spread this movement. For example, let's say we are organizing a program together. I'm just giving you a simple example. Uh, so let's say we are organizing a program together. Suppose I say, oh, I have a degree in physics. I, I don't know how to clean flows. I'm not going to do it. And, and if nobody is going to do it, then how are you going to organize a program? Who's going to clean up? Right? So it may not be my comfort zone, but uh, it may not be part of my material personality that I like to do these kind of things. But for the service of Krishna, we bend. We, we flex for the service of Krishna. So um, what is it? Uh, that is one thing that we should be voluntarily willing to flex to do whatever it takes uh, to serve the Lord. Of course, everyone has limitations, but one should try to push one's boundary slowly and slowly. One becomes one comes to the platform eventually. That whatever it takes, one is really able to do it for Krishna. Now, the other the the, the real question that you were I mean the, the specific question that you are asking about is about there are needs of the congregation. How do we, how do we uh, adapt to those needs? You know? So uh, we can adapt to the extent that we can. At the same time, uh, Krishna consciousness is a very uh, Krishna consciousness cannot be contained. By its very nature, it's infinite. It cannot be contained. Nobody can bottle up Krishna consciousness. So if you have a certain talent in doing certain things, uh, so Krishna, it cannot be contained. So you will be able to engage that in the uh, service of the Lord somehow or the other. While we, if, if you just try to avoid trying to uh, be part of a community and try to do things together, that will not work. You can try to do both simultaneously. I don't know the specific situation that you're on. I'm just giving you a very generic answer and probably it's simplistic also. Uh, it may not solve your problem, but uh, I'm just talking on a very basic guideline. But usually... These things, depending on individual circumstances, you have you have to see what is to be done. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for the answer. Hare mm -hmm. Krishna. But you should remember one thing, Mataji, that this, mm -hmm. I've seen this uh, time and again, time and again, I've seen this. The Krishna consciousness cannot be contained because it, Krishna is infinite. You know, he's an infinite person. So if you if you want to do something right for Prabhupada's movement, you want to do something which is interesting, which can... Which will, which will spread the movement, which will make good devotees, and whatever it is, it cannot be contained. Externally, it cannot be contained. No matter what, it may appear, sometimes it may appear very, uh, how is it, how am I ever going to do something like this for Krishna? But it will happen. Uh, because that's the very nature of Krishna consciousness. It cannot, something which is genuine in Krishna consciousness cannot be contained. It will always manifest itself. But at the same time, uh, when we are part of a yatra, the Yatra leaders would have some priorities and things. And we should try to uh, work together. While trying to work together, also we can try to, uh, Krishna will provide opportunities for us to do what we think we are good at for Krishna's service. Yes, Prabhu. Yes, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Lila Madhuri Lalita Madhuri. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Dhanavad Prabhu. Um, from your answer for that Mataji, I have a question Prabhu. So you said that the Atra in which we are connected, they will have some priority. Uh, definitely they will expect us to do the same. Yes. So as you said, in case if we are interested in something else and as you said, which is genuine, which uh, will help us to increase Krishna conscious, then which one should be given priority from our side? Oh, Mataji, see the principle of Krishna consciousness is that uh, as long as you are not being asked to sell some wine or something, which is not uh, against Krishna conscious principles, 
as long see uh, okay uh, i'll talk about a broader principle here uh, quite often we get uh, caught up because we think our authority i'm not saying you for in particular in general i'm talking about you know, we sometimes have problems with authorities because we want authorities to be perfect or authorities to be always doing the i mean the perfect things but our principle of krishna consciousness is not perfect authorities rather our principle of i mean of course the proper is perfect and the Uh, you have pure devotees who are perfect i'm not saying no but at the same time we cannot expect that at all levels of authority everyone is going to be perfect yes it is possible i'm not saying no but in general it's st- statistically you don't find that easily you know so then what do you do so it doesn't matter whether your authority or the people who are working with are perfect or not as long as the f- instruction that you're getting is perfect it does not matter for example no matter what their priority is but if they are doing something which is legitimate in krishna consciousness even though you may not be able to relate to it you may think something else could be done but as long as it is legitimate and bona fide we are duty bound to follow otherwise there will be anarchy because prabhupada has expected us to follow the system that he set up even during his time we only had the temple and the temple presidents and things like so part of our love for prabhupada part of our uh, success not part of it, an important aspect of our success lies in the fa- lies in how willing we are to comply with the system that proper set up so uh, i mean I, i have also been through different situations in my own life but i've seen each time that as long as uh, we are willing to follow an instruction it may it may not be the most perfect thing according to us but as long as it is not unbonafide or non bonafide let, let me put it like that as long as like okay, some 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 Uh, leaders may have a priority to uh, uh, worship deity somebody may have a priority to distribute books somebody may have co- priority about congregation preaching or different different things different people may prioritize different things now according to us according to our estimation according to our understanding of the audience the place and all that we may think something else is better but as long as uh, the authorities are doing something which is bona fide we are supposed to cooperate we are supposed to cooperate that is what is expected in, of us that's why proper said the your love for me will be shown by how much you can cooperate together what i'm saying is if you do that if you do that then if your specific ideas are good and if krishna wants it will he will make it happen but you cannot expect that if you don't cooperate still you will succeed in fact our success in krishna consciousness depends on krishna's pleasure like in fact in the bhagavatam The, uh, the lord appears in front of the prachetas and he says the reason i appear in front of you is the use due to the fact that you all cooperate so well amongst each other so it's so pleasing to the lord that it still becomes a cause for the lord's appearance so this is something which we need to be conscious of the very fact that we are willing to cooperate for prabhupada's sake that itself brings us directly in touch with the supreme lord so he will help us personally this is something we should, we should not forget so even though we have a plan how do we execute the plan we can execute the plan only when you please the lord and we please the lord by cooperating right so by doing that then if your individual plan is bona fide legitimate krishna likes it he will make it happen krishna consciousness cannot be contained thank you professor i hope the question of priority is clear to you Uh, we cannot relegate what a legitimate authority structure wants us to do we cannot that should always be a priority we can have our idea of what we would like to do but then when krishna is pleased it will happen yes bro thank you like krishna prabhu thank you pranam to vishnu prabhat hari bol shali shri may i elaborate a little bit more on on your wonderful answers to those two questions pardon prabhu may, may i uh, may i try and elaborate a little bit more on on your uh, wonderful please story. please Very please go ahead your voice think, is not very clear i don't know if if you're far away from the speaker you, or um yeah i've got my earbuds on sorry can you can you hear me yes bro yes yes okay yeah. i was just just going to add to to your to your wonderful points that i think what we sometimes see uniqueness in ourselves are actually our habit- habitual propensities 
um, you know, we are of a certain nature and we feel that's our uniqueness. It's actually Krishna and the Gita Ji and the Bhagavatam and all across our literature, Vedic literature, defines what the qualities of, of Vaishnavas should be like. And, and to, for us to mold ourselves into those qualities does not mean that we're sacrificing our uniqueness. It means that we're becoming better human beings. That leads uh, uh, us to being better cooperative with each other, etc. So I think quite often we mis misinterpret uniqueness um, to be our, our potentially bad habitual propensities and to remold those to, to more Vedic standards does not mean that we've lost our individuality, which is a, you know, a false understanding. I think quite often we see within the devotee community, our skill sets are something that may be unique, we can deploy, but our propensities, we should be, be very um, willing to let go of or, or change or mold or remold to, to those of um, uh, Vaishnava as defined by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. So that was just a small point I wanted so to This is a very important point that he brought up. A very nice point that he brought up. There's a difference between propensity and skill sets. A very important difference. Uh, propensities, all of us have to develop the 26 qualities of a pure devotee. Nobody has exception to that. We should all develop, give up all our other propensities and develop those, uh, develop those qualities. At the same time, all of us may have different skill sets, which can be uh, engaged perfectly in the service of the Lord. But we can engage it perfectly only when we develop those 26 qualities. But still, those skill sets are not our uniqueness. It is, I mean, these are still our, these are, these are products of our body and mind. But the soul itself has a certain uniqueness, which will manifest once we'll attain full perfection. Yes, forgive me, Prabhu. I was just trying to bring that point up. So thank you. Thank you. I mean, thank you for bringing, the, bringing out the difference between propensity and skill set. It's a very useful contribution. There is, uh, there is no excuse for not being clean. There's no excuse for being, uh, for uh, behaving improperly, saying, oh, this is my nature, I can shout at people. You know, it's just, there's no, there no excuse for non-Vaishnava behavior. Next question on the chat. Thank you, Madhuzi. All right, so we'll end for today and we'll resume next class. Thank you. One chapel with the Rubyas Shah, Kapasan Dubey, which are Paritana and Bhavani, if you wish to be on the